Welcome to this reporter's special. I'm Sue Lloyd Roberts. The country of Zimbabwe is in meltdown, according to the United Nations Special Envoy, Jan Egland. And having just returned, I would agree. Inflation is running at 600 percent. The near one million people made homeless in a recent government operation face a rainy season without proper shelter and starvation. Those who oppose President Robert Mugabe are persecuted, and so we have concealed the identities of some of the people who spoke to us. I was allowed into the country as a freelance reporter. The face of modern Zimbabwe, the country that once exported food throughout southern Africa, can't feed its own people. Mothers have walked more than 100 miles to get help at this mission hospital, where the only two doctors are from Germany and the Congo. Most of the Zimbabwean doctors have already fled the country in despair. <coughs> it's a hopeless task. 90% of the malnourished children who arrive here are HIV positive, and to fight the disease, you need extra calories. Families who once relied on the churches and aid agencies to give them food now have nothing. Even if the children leave the hospital alive, they're invariably brought back. You expect, I think, some children, even you discharge them, they reach the target weight. After two months, three months, they come back. It's the same problem. Because the mother, when they go back, they're going to give them the same things. Salsa with vegetable, no meat, no eggs, no peanut butter, no beans, huh? no sugar, no, no milk. Hmm? It's very difficult. It's getting worse, it's getting worse. Hunger and despair stalk a country that has been reduced to the pre-modern world. Electricity is sporadic, rubbish is uncollected, life expectancy has been reduced to about 30 years. People struggle to find water and food. There's no petrol, no ambulances for the sick and dying, and if you support the opposition, no hiding from Mugabe's fury. Mary is an activist for the MDC, the Movement for Democratic Change, and her entire family has suffered for it. Thirty soldiers burst into the house. They took me into my room and started beating me. And they poured a liquid on my body that made my skin come off. Then I heard them beating my mother. I said, why are you beating her? It's me you want. Then they made me watch as they pulled apart her legs and forced a gun, an AK-47, into her private parts. They yelled at her. How many political activists have you produced? <laughs> As Robert Mugabe tightens his grip, the country is collapsing. Five years after the president seized the commercial farms, production has fallen by 50%, bringing the standard of living in what was one of the richest countries on the continent to the level of the poorest. Meanwhile, Mugabe continues to blame the whites, Britain, Tony Blair, anything but his own crazy policies. It doesn't matter how strong they may be, how powerful they may be, they are foreigners. I was among a handful of journalists allowed into the country to cover the recent elections for a new Senate House. If the government was trying to prove to us that life is normal and democracy is alive and well, it didn't work. At most polling stations, there were more officials than voters. Fewer than 15% bothered to turn up. Elections in Zimbabwe, people say, are an expensive irrelevance. They're always rigged and people don't have time to go and vote because they're too busy queuing elsewhere. In. In. This two mile long queue for petrol has been here for eight days and they're still waiting. Those who have money in the bank have to queue several times a day to accumulate the 85,000 Zimbabwean dollars you need to buy a loaf of bread. And everywhere there are queues for food. Bread, mealy meal, oil, sugar. And yet, for years now, Robert Mugabe has denied there's a problem. 
the capacity for fantasy and make-believe in the Robert Mugabe government knows no bounds. When the UN offered him millions of dollars of food aid earlier in the year, he turned it down saying, food shortage, what food shortage? When the IMF voiced concerns about Zimbabwe's ability to pay back its debts, Robert Mugabe said, we have money, and he promptly raided the accounts of foreign companies working here. If he were standing beside me now, he'd no doubt say, Q, what Q? But a government informer was listening and I had forgotten. Food queues don't exist in Zimbabwe today. When I got back to our car, a uniformed officer was sitting in my seat and it was surrounded by plainclothes policemen. We managed to hide these pictures before being taken to Harare police station and detained. I was strip searched to check that I had no other subversive material on my person. The government tries to keep a lot hidden in Zimbabwe today, like the whereabouts of the near one million people who've disappeared this year from shanty towns which used to thrive here on the edges of the cities. The demolition teams did such a good job, there's barely a trace of them left. Robert Mugabe called this, surely the most brutal attack on his people so far, Operation Restore Order, perhaps because the victims supported the opposition. Thousands of small shops, stalls and homes were destroyed by police, army and bulldozers. Home for Joseph is now a garden shed. We had to meet him before dawn to avoid being seen. He told us that police destroyed his house two days after the last general election in which the opposition candidate had won in his area. They were very vicious because an MDC man had won. They came in the night and put guns at our heads and told us to pull down our own houses. We had to camp in the open, on the streets. My wife gave birth. Our baby girl only lived for two weeks. He sent his wife and remaining children to live in the country. We heard how thousands of former slum dwellers are being dumped in isolated rural areas where the people can barely feed themselves, let alone cope with the new urban arrivals. People say that these new settlements are little more than open prison camps where outsiders are forbidden. As we discovered when we tried to visit one, Hopely Farm, 10 miles outside Harare. The guards at the gate told us it was a restricted area and we had to get government permission, which was, of course, refused. Yes, yes. Hey, stop, stop taking that, can stop that, just stop that. That's why we're here. Right. Displaced people, like food queues, uh -huh. okay. don't exist in Zimbabwe today. So who are you again, sir? Right, I think it's... We asked locals to get us the pictures of what's going on inside. They showed people living under makeshift covers of plastic and cardboard in this, the rainy season from where they're forced to attend meetings by soldiers in the camp. There are no schools, no health care, no clean water and no food. Former town dwellers and small traders now scrub around for insects. This is what we eat now. There's no other food here. I don't know whether we are going to survive. They make us attend political meetings every day. The youth brigades force people to attend these meetings. But what's the point of them? All we can think of is hunger and starvation. Mugabe introduced the notorious youth brigades five years ago to recruit young paramilitary thugs to do his dirty work for him. They've been used to terrorize the people and now, it would appear, to indoctrinate those who oppose his ZANU-PF party. For people who've lost everything, these meetings are a form of torture, as another inmate at Hopley Farm explains. They come for us at any time, uh, often even at night, when we are tired and weak and want to lie down. They say everyone must wake up and go. They say, you supported the MDC. You are rubbish. That's why we brought you here. They make us tell them everything and then they lecture us. I'm finding it very difficult. I, I'm talking to you because the world must know what is going on in Zimbabwe. 
We drove west to Bulawayo, an opposition stronghold, and where the shortages are even more acute. People walk miles to find fresh water, or, after a rainfall, collect it from ditches. On a weekly basis, our members are dying. We don't know if it's from AIDS, but it looks more or less it's from starvation. Uh, Representatives of those who lost their homes in the recent clearances call on the Roman Catholic Archbishop, Pius Nkube, a man who has never hesitated to criticize the regime. We'll be having 200,000 people dead here by end of next year. Mugabe, who's the biggest murderer and liar, we should be standing up against this man, telling him to just get out. Mugabe has no heart for his people. He's a gross oppressor. He's doing things worse than what the white government did. They never did such things. But all this in the, in the interest of keeping himself in power. I'm afraid that people are going to end up dying. People will be dead here. A, a good 200,000 people could perish of starvation. First, because the prices are too high. No one can afford these prices. Uh, secondly, because Mugabe is not distributing food aid. The churches are struggling to help the people of Zimbabwe. Normal services are allowed, but the use of church buildings to give out food or as a refuge is forbidden. After the destruction of their homes, tens of thousands of people fled to churches throughout the country, but then the police attacked church buildings and made them move on. Nothing, it would appear, is sacred in the Mugabe regime. According to one of the few aid agencies still allowed to operate in the country, the motive behind the urban clearances is sinister and long-term. There's no protest possible after this. They have demolished the opposition uh, completely and utterly. But I think there's also a much more sinister um, objective that some people have spoken about, um, and that's very dimly seen, and that it has reduced an staggering number of people to clients of the state, where they will be directly beholding on the state for almost everything. Health, food, water, shelter, the whole lot. And that makes them extremely compliant. They're very unlikely in the situation to be of people who are totally beholding to the state to challenge the state. Politically, therefore, Mugabe looks safe, just as the government-controlled newspapers described the brutal slum clearances as urban renewal. They've also ignored the pathetic turnout for the latest elections and reported them as another Mugabe triumph. And so after these phony elections, everything in the Robert Mugabe camp would appear to be rosy. An apparent zanu PF landslide victory and the leader of the opposition discredited. The question now for the future of Zimbabwe is whether an effective opposition can reform and whether the people, enfeebled by fear and hunger, can get their discontent heard. The tragedy for Zimbabwe is that the only credible opposition party is now hopelessly divided. The leader of the Movement for Democratic Change, Morgan Changarai, has called for a boycott of all elections, while others argue that the MDC should remain involved in the parliamentary process. Whatever the argument, surely a divided opposition is not what the country needs. The fact that the leadership is arguing amongst itself uh, does not reflect the mood on the ground, that the MDC is the alternative to ZANU-PF tyranny, that it is the hope of the people, and that uh, we, they are not going to allow this party to break up or to destroy itself in the face of Mugabe dictatorship. Do you think the MDC can get itself together again to fight Robert Mugabe? Oh, yeah, certainly. I'm sure that uh, the job at hand demands that the, the MDC has no option but to unite and fight the real enemy. And the real enemy is not internal in the MDC. The real enemy is external to the MDC, which is Mugabe and his misgovernance. That's where we have to focus. Brave words. But Robert Mugabe is an astute politician. It's rumored that Mugabe himself orchestrated the split in the opposition. And he's well aware that he has to come up with new ways of keeping his grip on the country. 
His motive in allowing white-owned farms to be seized by black army veterans and his cronies was to win popular support. Production on these farms has halved, and he now blames the new owners for the country's economic collapse. He now has a new plan. It's called Operation Command Agriculture, as a major in the Zimbabwean army risked his job to explain to us. Instructions have already been passed on to battalion commanders to prepare their men to move on to the farms. Mugabe says the people who are on the farms are now opposition supporters and they are sabotaging the country and so he wants the army to move in. Do you think the army is up to the job? I don't think it will work because soldiers are not trained for farm work. They are trained to fight. They don't have the skills. It's out of desperation that Mugabe is doing this. It's not going to work. The farmers who lost their land agree. Roy Bennett was a farmer and an MP until he confronted and pushed a member of the Mugabe cabinet in parliament for which he was suspended and imprisoned. He's hugely popular among the blacks in his constituency and a court has just ruled that he can stand for parliament again. Like many of the whites who are Zimbabwean citizens and have nowhere else to go, he's built up a new business from farmer to panel beater. What does he think of Operation Command Agriculture? It's a non-starter. How, how are you going to put unskilled people on to, to, to do a skilled person's jobs? Farming is a commitment. Farming is something you're born into. It's not something that you can just do. Farming is 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, no let up. And it's a commitment. Um, if it's done properly, it can be very profitable. If it's not done properly, you might as well pull your money into a hole and light it. But the army will be forced to make this commitment. How, how? When they don't know what to do, they don't know what buttons to press, they have no idea on timing, they have no idea on, 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 on the basic um, logistics and, and mechanisms of farming. It's, 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 you can't do it out of a textbook. It's something that comes to you through years of experience. When I was last in Zimbabwe three years ago, only half of the 4,000 commercial farms had been taken from their owners. Farmers like Peter Piper, surveying his fields lying fallow and unproductive and the lack of activity among the new owners, were still hoping that the government might change its mind. But today, only a couple of hundred farms in Zimbabwe remain with their original owners. The once buoyant export trade in tobacco, coffee and grain has collapsed. Zimbabwe today imports 80% of its food. And where are the farmers now? I found Peter Piper, once proud owner of some 27,000 acres, behind a stall at a handicraft fair in a white suburb of Harare, selling homemade pickles. We're no longer able to farm. Everyone's got other skills. We process the little bit of produce that we make and market it. This is one way. The other way, I have a, a street vendor's license and I go and vend in the nearest town. On the street, I sell veggies. And how are you and the rest of the white community coping? I can't really speak for everyone because it has affected different people in different ways. But for us, it's, it's been difficult, it's been very hard, especially for parents who are um, getting on in years and it's literally shattered their life. They've been, they, their life's work has been torn apart in front of their eyes. Of course, the whites have been better able to survive Mugabe's rule than the blacks of Zimbabwe. They had more money to begin with. The white farmers who were able to get their money out are now farming in Mozambique, Zambia and South Africa. Those who didn't and who have nowhere to go are trying their hand at anything, turning to craft skills like making jewelry and the couple whose hunting lodge was burned down a month ago who now rely on Lindsay Johnson's paintings. Well, I've always, I hope, always had talents with my painting, so I can always paint. It's one thing Zimbabweans can do is make a plan, because every time you get something going good, somebody can come and take it away from you. And you've got to make another plan. It's a matter of survival. And with inflation running at 600% and the economy in free fall, surviving in Zimbabwe is difficult. I needed the country's most respected economist with me when I came to pay for our lunch, to help count the over one million dollars required for a few pizzas and sandwiches. We've wiped out the value of our currency and the difficulty is we can't print it fast enough. 
But my forecast suggests that we're going to see inflation rising well above a thousand percent during the course of next year. We will be approaching hyperinflation at that time. And uh, if we're very lucky and they bring in a lot of discipline, they might be able to arrest it from going to 2,000%. This inflationary spiral you describe, what does this mean in human terms? Uh, yes, we've gone back a couple of hundred years into the barter trade of years gone by, centuries gone by. And I think next year we might well see the shoe factory offering shoes to the employees and the shoe, f the employees going and swapping shoes for cans of beans or pockets of mealy meal or uh, you know, a couple of sides of beef. None of these commodities are within the reach of the victims of restore order. The only informal economy still operating today is the sale of funeral flowers. And even these men have to hide in a ditch or the police come and grab the flowers from their hands. And they're the lucky ones. The question is whether those who've survived Mugabe's latest attack on his people can resist the man whom the Archbishop calls the biggest murderer of them all. It is time for the people of Zimbabwe to rise up. There's no future for this country with Robert Mugabe. But I, for one, doubt whether the impoverished people of Zimbabwe have the strength or wherewithal for an uprising. It's gaining with the goods. Sooner will be the shell, but today he lost a bit. Yes. Huh? What happened? Back at the hospital, the doctor is about to finish after a 16-hour day when a mother arrives with her three-year-old son. She's walked and hitched lifts for 200 miles and four days to get here. The doctor berates the mother when she hears that she's only given the child root vegetables for the past week. And then she adds, what's the point? There is no food and there is no hope in this country. The little boy died the next day.